Hi, just continuing from page 179. I looked back and there were the demon rats racing with their scabby paws toward me, their eyes filled with the big M, murder, and their pointy heads bobbing up and down with each leap. I couldn't scream. I couldn't get enough air into my lungs for screaming. I could only run. But the faster I ran, the more their yellow hatred grew. And every time I looked back, which was a lot, they were flat out after me, their scabby whiskers swept back by their speed, their yellow teeth clacking. I could imagine those teeth sinking into my heels like the assassin's daggers sinking into Caesar, and I ran faster. I'd be running still if the tennis courts hadn't been there. Since they were, I sprinted into the courts and kicked the wire gate closed behind me. Sycorax and Caliban smashed into the gate and poked their yellow scabby snouts through. Then they started to climb the fence, really. They started to climb the fence, never taking their red eyes off me. Fear can bring out the big M. I ran across the courts and I was up and over the far side fence before they were up and over the near side one. By that time, Mr. Guareshi, who had heard all the screaming, was trying to get the exterminator to go inside the tennis courts to catch the rats, but the exterminator wouldn't go near them. Did you see those teeth? He said. He got into his truck and drove a safe distance away. Meanwhile, Sycorax and Caliban were climbing up the far side fence after me. Before they reached the ground outside, the entire schoolyard had emptied, me last, when Danny Hupfer grabbed me from where I'd been standing in a paralyzed horror. So what happened after that is all a guess. At the same time that Sycorax and Caliban hit the bottom of the fence and ran into the parking lot looking for me, a school bus was coming back in from the late afternoon run. The driver later said that when she saw the rats and tried to swerve, but that they leaped onto their hind legs and jumped in front of her. She slammed down on her brakes, but the rats stood their ground, their paws up, their snouts pulled back, their yellow teeth clacking, their demon eyes flashing, none of which you'd been able to recognize among the squashed bits when the bus, after skidding on the suddenly slick asphalt, finally came to a stop. And as the exterminator drove away, since there was nothing more for him to do, the green and brown sky finally opened and the rain came down in torrents so fast it blew sideways. And when it had raged for about the time it takes to run two laps around Camillo Junior High, it stopped and the green sky evaporated and it was the Ides of March, a beautiful spring day. A new record was set for the three mile run for a Long Island school that afternoon, and I'm including high schools here. People said afterward that they had never seen anything like it, that kind of speed from a seventh grader. So I made the varsity team and had the big M to keep running, especially since it stayed beautiful for the rest of March as the days grew longer, so long that it was still light when my father and sister came home from Hood Hood and Associates at supper time, I practiced every afternoon after school with the other varsity runners, me, the only seventh grader, while the sun was yellow and warm and the sky blue and white. I ran leaning forward, my arms and legs like pistons, head straight and still, hands loose, breathing controlled. I ran like Jesse Owens with the big M. Meanwhile, the story of the rats grew larger. People went to visit the spot where they had met the bus. Doug Switek's brother had two teeth that he claimed were from Caliban, and he would show them to you for a quarter. Mrs. Sidman was the most heroic figure of the story, and even first graders were drawing pictures of her carrying Caliban and Sycorax through the halls of Camillo Junior High. In all of those pictures, she looked like the warrior that Ariel had wanted to be stern and serious and powerful. A third grader drew a coat of arms for her with two dead rats beneath her feet. 
Charles, the fifth grader of the lovely handwriting, inscribed the motto beneath, to the death. The D had a whole lot of swirling loops inside it. The only one who came out badly in the stories was my T. And honestly, I couldn't figure it out. No one but my T had stood her ground beside Miss Sidman while all the rest of us scrammed across the room. But instead of her getting a coat of arms and being made into a warrior, people started to talk about her and not just behind her back but so that she could hear them about how people in Vietnam ate rats, how she was just hoping for a good meal, how she thought they were rat burgers on the run, stuff like that. And so one day when outside the yellow forsythia bushes were weaving themselves together and the daffodils were playing their trumpets and the lilacs were starting to bud and getting all giddy, we were going through the lunch line and Mrs. Biggio handed my tea her tuna casserole surprise, and one of the penitentiary-bound eighth graders said loudly to Mrs. Biggio, don't you have any rat surprise for her? And then he turned to my tea and said, why don't you go back home where you can find some? And then my tea started to cry, just stood there crying. And Danny took his entire tray which was filled with tuna casserole surprise and two glasses of chocolate milk and red jello with peaches and dumped it over the penitentiary bound eighth grader's stupid head. And then before the eighth grader could open his stupid eyes to see who had done it, Danny punched him as hard as he could and broke his stupid nose, which got Danny a four day suspension which Mr. and Mrs. Hupfer used to take him to Washington, D.C. because they were so proud of him. At lunch recess on the day he came back, he told us about climbing the Washington Monument, touring the White House, seeing Hubert Humphrey waving from a limousine, sprinting up the Capitol steps three at a time, running at tempo through the maze of fences the police were putting up to control the demonstration that Martin Luther King was bringing to Washington next month and walking up to President Lyndon Baines Johnson and shaking his hand, all of which we believed except for the last part. But the next part is no lie. When we got back in from recess, Mrs. Biggio and Mrs. Baker were holding two trays filled with fried bananas, really fried bananas rolled in crushed nuts, dipped in coconut and topped with caramel sauce warm caramel sauce. Can you ex imagine what all four of those together smelled like? Sweet and fruity and spicy and warm and creamy and chewy all at the same time. That's about as close as I can get. It's the kind of smell that makes you hungry just thinking about it. Mrs. Baker held the tray like she was carrying gold and frankincense and myrrh. It's a recipe from Vietnam, she said. Mrs. Biggio has made them for our class. We cheered. The caramel sauce is called Nguoc Mao. Did I say that correctly, Mai Ti Huang? Mai Ti shrugged and smiled, and Mrs. Baker laughed. And then she and Mrs. Biggio walked up and down the aisles, and we each took a plate with a fried banana smothered in caramel sauce on it. And when Mrs. Biggio got to my tea, she stopped and lifted a plate down onto her desk and said, I am so sorry, my tea. I am so sorry. That night, Walter Cronkite reported that in Quezon, some of the tunnels the Viet Cong were digging now reached to within 50 yards of the marine fences. There were more mortar, sh mortar shells lobbed in. There were more pictures of Marines deep in their bunkers with their hands over their ears. Casualties were light, the White House announced. In Camillo Junior High, we ate fried bananas with warm nok wow. We sang a song that my tea taught us about bananas, though it could have been about elephants and we wouldn't have known it since we only knew two words of Vietnamese. And when we were done, Mrs. Biggio and my tea held each other tightly and it seemed to all of us that they did not want to let go. And that's the end of 
the March chapter.